you remember the 1970s? The Vietnam War, Richard Nixon and the Watergate scandal, Muhammad Ali, or Bjorn Borg, Led Zeppelin, Bob Marley, or the Bee Gees, Jaws, or Star Wars, Bell Bottom Trousers, or Space Hoppers, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or The Joy of Sex. Neither do we. And it is often said that if you remember the 70s, you probably weren't really there. But for all its cultural and sporting achievements, the 70s was a political, economic and financial failure. Towards the end of World War II, the Allies agreed on fixed currency exchange rates, the Bretton Woods system, with America, who then owned two thirds of the world's gold, agreeing to fix the dollar to gold at $35 per ounce. This provided financial stability for post-war prosperity. But after years of profligate government spending on the Vietnam War and the Great Society, so-called guns and butter fiscal largesse, there had been a run on the US dollar by foreign central banks. By the beginning of the 70s, it had become clear that America no longer had enough gold to honour its potential Bretton Woods liabilities. For every $1 of gold held at Fort Knox, owing to rising trade deficits, there was now estimated to be $9 held outside of the US. So rather than slow its economy by raising interest rates or cutting government spending, in August 1971, President Nixon terminated this fixed gold convertibility, with the US dollar becoming a permanent fiat paper currency. This was the first time that the leading global power had adopted fiat money as a permanent measure. Such a worldwide fiat monetary system had no historical precedence. It still exists today. From this moment, the market would decide the value of all currencies, which would now not be fixed but floating. Investors had little reason to be confident in the value of fiat currencies, and so instead they stored their wealth in gold. From being fixed at $35 in 1971, gold ended the decade at $512. In other words, in just 10 years, gold doubled, then doubled again, then again, and again. There was a similar development in crude oil, where the price went from being fixed by the Seven Sisters, the Western oil majors, to instead being determined by the governments of the main exporting countries, OPEC. OPEC also rebelled against US political hegemony, imposing oil export embargoes on the West, in 1973 and 1979. From being fixed at just $1.80 per barrel, under its new masters, oil rose to $25.80 by 1980. In other words, in just 10 years, oil doubled, then doubled again, then again, and again. The world's two most important commodities, gold and oil, both rose 15 times over the decade delivering average returns of 31% per annum. It was the decade of the Great Inflation. Inflation in the US was just 1% in 1964, but averaged over 7% during the 70s and peaked at 15% in 1980. Inflation in the UK was only 1% in 1967, but averaged over 13% during the decade and peaked at 27% in 1975. Interest rates rose gradually, then suddenly. They averaged over 7% in the US and peaked at 20% in 1980. In the UK, they averaged 9% and peaked at 17%, also in 1980. Governments introduced price controls, with corporate profits providing a partial inflationary buffer to consumers who were also voters. Attempts to restrict wage rises led to regular industrial action and labor strikes. In economic terms, the 1970s was a lost decade. How did it do for investors? The American stock market fell 50% between 1973 and 1974 and rose only 17% over the decade, roughly 1% per annum. The UK stock market 
fell 70% in 1973 to 1974, but rose 53% over the decade, roughly 4% per annum. The bigger problem was inflation. £1 in 1970 was worth just 30p by 1980, and $1 was worth just 50 cents. Nominal stock market returns were modestly positive overall, but in real terms, stock market investors in the US had lost 42% over the decade, with half of the return being eroded by inflation. In real terms, those in the UK lost 53%, with 70% of the return eroded by inflation. Inflation had picked the pocket of the investor. This was an invisible crash, masked by the money illusion of inflation. Savings had been spared the pain of nominal losses, but wealth had still died, drowning in a bubble bath, dying quietly without investors noticing. The only protection was investing in commodities and commodity companies. One pound invested in gold or crude oil in 1970 would be worth 15 pounds by 1980. Even after inflation, one pound invested in gold or crude oil in 1970 would still be worth seven pounds 50 in real terms. Inflation has returned to our economies today, running at 8% in America and the UK, even before recent rises in food and energy prices. Let's examine some of the causes of recent inflation. Deglobalization, decarbonization, and central bank money printing. Deglobalization. Globalization is deflationary. Deglobalization is inflationary. In 1972, President Nixon went to China and began the process of integrating the world's most populous country into the global economy. China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. Last year, China was responsible for 29% of global manufacturing, from almost nothing in 1972. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. Russia exported its commodities, oil, coal, metals like nickel, aluminium, platinum, palladium, and agricultural products to the West. With globalization, the lowest cost country becomes the dominant producer exporting the best product for the cheapest price to the rest of the world. The result is economic growth, which is deflationary. But what happens if globalization reverses? First China and now Russia are disengaging from the global economy. China will no longer bring deflation to manufactured and industrial products. Russia will no longer bring deflation to commodity products. They are forming their own power block in competition to the West. The West now needs to insource. This will involve rebuilding its own industrial and commodity supply chains, bringing this back onto its own balance sheet. This process will require significant investment in what was previously seen as old economy industries, diverting capital from other activities which the West has recently specialised in, like technological innovation or convenient consumer products. The West also switched off fossil fuel investment before it was prudent to do so. Western oil companies have been told by investors and governments that they are a sunset industry, that they should give money back to shareholders or even invest in alternative energy instead of investing to find new oil reserves that can replace existing production. We track the spending of the 11 biggest Western oil companies over the last decade. They reinvested just $100 billion of their profits last year. This sounds like a big number, but this compares to $250 billion per annum less than a decade ago. To put this into further perspective, the world's biggest energy company, Saudi Arabia's Aramco, just announced it might invest as much as $50 billion this year. So just one company, Aramco, are now doing half of the combined investment of the 11 biggest oil companies in Europe, North America, and Brazil. Who will control the oil price in the future? Replacing Russian oil and gas will require the West to reinvest in fossil fuels. The amount of oil 
Western oil companies found last year fell to a record low of just 12% of their annual production. New oil and gas reserves equivalent to just 4% of current annual global demand. Less drilling means less supply, less energy security, and higher oil and gas prices, as well as more political instability. Unless Western commodity companies invest in new supply, commodity prices like oil will continue to rise, and they will hand control of the world's most important commodities to countries that are largely hostile to the West. It is a recipe for disaster. The West now needs to get serious about drilling for oil and gas again. This will help our energy security, but it will also be inflationary, since Russian gas and Saudi oil was cheaper to produce. We will face the same issues with other commodities, as well as semiconductors, manufactured and industrial products. Just like the consumer hoards fuel and foodstuffs in times of shortages, governments will stockpile resources and companies will move from just-in-time inventory to just-in-case, which will involve more costs and will tie up much more capital. Deglobalization, insourcing stuff we used to outsource, is therefore highly inflationary. Decarbonization. Decarbonization is inflationary. The West has decided to replace an energy economy predominantly fueled by historically cheap and reliable fossil fuels with a renewable energy economy. This requires huge capital expenditure and government subsidies. Once built, renewables produce low quality weather dependent power, which is inherently unreliable and economically inferior to what it is replacing at the cost of a significant proportion of national wealth. This energy transition has been happening at breakneck speed before the technology exists to ensure that it can be done successfully and at a scale and a cost which is not financially ruinous. It places a high regard on carbon free energy and a very low value on power grids being able to turn energy on and off depending on demand. This will result in a glut of cheap power when the wind blows but more expensive and unreliable power on average. This is inflationary and risks the deindustrialization of Europe. Electrification is very commodity intensive. The electrification of transportation, homes and industry will likely require double the amount of electricity generation on top of replacing the power currently generated using fossil fuels. Building a bigger power grid will require much more copper. Storing power in batteries is currently only feasible at small scale for short periods of time but it is incredibly metal intensive. Electric cars use up to five times more metals in their manufacturing than traditional combustion engine cars. So demand for metal commodities like nickel, aluminium and lithium will also increase. Ironically, the energy transition won't be very environmentally friendly, but it does mean that the prices of these metal commodities will go up. This is inflationary. Central bank money printing. According to the economist Milton Friedman, substantial inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon caused by the increase in the amount of fiat currency outstanding and its velocity in the economy. In other words, whether it is spent or saved. More money created, which is then spent for the same amount of goods outstanding, causes inflation. During the global financial crisis of 2008, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke was determined to avoid the mistakes of his predecessors of the 1930s by printing more money to balance against the risks of deflation and depression caused by the subprime debt crisis. Quantitative easing, asset purchases by central banks with new money they created, has along with zero interest rates become a staple tool of central bankers. It helped the ECB resolve the sovereign crisis in 2012 and more recently, reverse the stock market crash caused by COVID lockdowns. If governments can just print money, they are inclined to act less prudently, and are less likely to consider the financial costs of policies, like COVID lockdowns or decarbonisation. QE also distorted financial markets. No rational investor wants to bet against a central bank with unlimited firepower. Instead, investors thought they could just keep betting on asset price appreciation, fueled by the new cheap money created by central banks. It was a bull market in almost everything. 
Today, the Bank of England owns around 40% of all UK gilts and the Federal Reserve around a quarter of all US treasuries, essentially financing all new government borrowing over the last decade. Once central banks start printing money, this process becomes addictive. Instead of raising taxes or cutting public spending, Western governments have financed themselves by money printing. Throughout history, this has always led to the invisible tax of inflation. The response to COVID saw maximum monetary and fiscal stimulus. Central banks did as much QE in the response to COVID as over the previous 12 years, and they kept going, even when it was clear that economic meltdown had been avoided. Governments who had previously insisted on fiscal austerity as a balance to aggressive monetary stimulus decided to also throw their lot in with wartime levels of fiscal stimulus. This occurred at the same time as many industries were supply constrained by restrictions on mobility. The result was a massive economic and stock market boom with inflation now out of control. Evidence of high, widespread and persistent inflation has also changed inflationary expectations. People no longer delay purchases in the belief that goods will be cheaper in the future. They may decide to save less. This increases the velocity of money. The initial decade of QE did not see widespread inflation, owing to the counterbalancing deflationary forces of a banking and then sovereign crisis, also globalization, and the fact that wealth was unevenly accumulated by the already wealthy, who were much more likely to save rather than to spend. This has now changed. The toothpaste is now out of the tube. The genie is out of the bottle. They cannot be put back in. We now have structurally higher inflation. The question now is not actually why we have inflation, but why we don't have more of it. At the beginning of the 1970s, central bankers dismissed inflation as supply-led and therefore transitory. They had no tools to manage whack-a-mole supply bottlenecks and therefore thought it would be fighting the wrong battle if they raised interest rates to kill demand. Does that sound familiar today? Milton Friedman also compared inflation to alcoholism. When a country starts on an inflationary episode, the initial effects seem good. Jobs become more plentiful. Business is brisk. Almost everybody is happy, but then the increased spending starts to raise prices. It takes a larger and larger amount of alcohol or of money to give the alcoholic or the economy the same kick. Cure for alcoholism is simple to state. Stop drinking. The alcoholic who goes on the wagon suffers severe withdrawal pains. The initial side effects of a slower rate of monetary growth are painful, lower economic growth, and temporarily higher unemployment, without for a time much reduction in inflation. The painful side effects are one reason why the alcoholic and the inflationary nation both find it difficult to end their addictions. But another reason, at least in the earlier stages of the disease, may be even more important, the absence of a real desire to end the addiction. It was only at the end of the 1970s that inflation had become a big enough problem for the alcoholic to stop drinking, for deep and painful economic recession to become a price worth paying for low inflation. No such consensus exists today. When it does, the rules of the investment game might change again, but this is a long way down the road. In recent times, whenever the West and its financial markets have been in trouble, its central banks have come to the rescue with more cheap money. This is no longer an option. As a result, we are in a structural bear market for most asset prices. The end of an era of free money means the end of the almost everything bull market. What lessons can we learn for investing today? Like in our recent past, the 1960s witnessed a stock market boom in growth stocks, the so-called go-go years, where interest rates and inflation were low and the global economy was booming. But the glamorous buy-and-hold growth stocks of the 1960s, such as IBM, Polaroid and Xerox, were all terrible investments in the 70s. This wasn't because their profits collapsed, but because investors were no longer prepared to pay high valuations for future profits when the value of those profits would be uncertain and lower because of inflation. Most investors were ill-equipped for the changing macro regime. The previous stock market darlings became the dogs of the next decade and vice versa. 
fund managers who were the heroes of the 60s bull market became the villains of the 70s. These fund managers didn't change how they pick stocks. Instead, the stock market just changed the characteristics in stocks it rewarded. C'est la vie. What worked in markets changed because the world changed. Investors who adapted to the new rules could still do well. A similar change is occurring now, and this requires a different way of investing. Investors should think about diversifying away from the overall direction or beta of the stock market. Passive funds are solely dependent on market beta, as are most active funds. They might go up slightly more or less than the market, but they usually all go up and down at the same time. Investors might own different funds, but in reality, diversification benefits are limited because they are all dependent on positive market outcomes. This is called putting all of your investment eggs in the same market beta basket. Funds which deploy hedging strategies that also bet against stocks they don't like because the business model is unsustainable or the valuation is too high can offer a valuable non-correlated return profile that provides real diversification. Their market exposure should therefore be hedged when the market goes down, though this might also limit returns when the market goes up. Unlike most funds, it matters more what they are invested in rather than whether they are invested. It is important to remember that bear markets are much more volatile than bull markets with frequent wild swings. This means that although positive returns will be more difficult for the average investor, everyone's returns will be more volatile. This can be mitigated by better diversification. We should also distinguish between good volatility, where successes and failures will occur at different times to everything else in your portfolio, rather than bad volatility, which is highly correlated to the stock market overall. Good volatility with positive returns is like an insurance policy that pays you to own it. Despite equities having already entered a bear market, most investors seem to currently have their heads in the sand and are still investing in the same growth stocks that did well over the last decade. This is the equivalent of driving a car whilst looking in the rearview mirror with your fingers crossed. Unfortunately, rearview mirror investing is still how most people in the financial industry pick stocks and select funds. We have seen that what worked well in the 60s would have been a disaster in the 70s. We've also seen how the 1970s witnessed a bull market for commodities and a bear market and everything else. Investing in commodities could therefore provide a diversification benefit to overall portfolios. We believe that there are exceptional opportunities for investors in commodity stocks over the next decade and lots of tired investments everywhere else. Not everyone will agree with us that we are heading for a return to the 1970s. But everyone should worry about overexposure to growth stocks, which will continue to be a losing strategy in a high inflation investment environment. Everyone should be considering an investment refuge from a 1970s redux. If like us you are more worried about the future and want to learn more, then visit our website at Argonaut Capital.